morning, everybody. Hopefully you're having a good end of the summer. Uh, along with that, next uh, weekend is Labor Day, so obviously we will not be having our coaching call on on Monday. So uh, uh, you get your Labor Day off from uh, listening to me yammer on. So uh, please remember that. And then uh, just a couple of things here, why the bear market has yet, hasn't yet bottomed by the Bank of America. At the SP 500 slid 23% from the start of the year through June 16th. The index has bounced back 17%. And uh, in the article, see that only 30% of our bull markets, uh, only 30% of our bull market signposts have been hit. Those things that happen before a market hits bottom have triggered versus 80% of the prior market bottoms. They wrote in the commentary. So they say another pullback is likely. Uh, and then they're talking about another uh, Bank of America signpost on an enterprise value to sales basis, where sales should be evaluated uh, higher consumer price. The market multiple is successfully elevated plus 40% relative to history. That's possibly because real uh, sales growth, excluding energy, is essentially flat. That would reduce the sales segment of the multiple. So uh, one point that isn't mentioned by them is the biggest bearish factor is the market may be inflation. The Federal Reserve's interest rates hikes. And what did the Federal Reserve say? Going to continue to raise or going to start to lower, like a lot of people on the market on the street thought was hoping. Going to continue to raise or start to lower or slow down, like many in the street uh, was hoping. Yeah, they're going to continue to raise. Inflation uh, did, uh, could dampen consumer spending. Rate increases could weaken the economy and depressing corporate earnings. A distant barrier outside of inflation falling to zero percent. Do you think inflation is going to fall to zero percent, guys? Or the S&P 500 falling to 2,500? It's at 4,200 right now. Or an earnings surprise of 50 percent would be required to satisfy the rule of 20. So are we anywhere near to any of those things? <laughs> Inflation going to zero, S&P 500 falling to 2,500, or earnings go going up 50%. Do you think any chance uh, we're going to see earnings go up by 50% with uh, people right now being hammered with inflation? Yeah. And here's what you're seeing with the rule of 20. So we're still um, well above what? The rule of 20. So it's not over yet, guys. But today we want to talk about 15 science-backed uh, tips of making better sales calls. So start all sales calls with a bang. I always start your sales calls in style. Once that you try to figure out how to increase room service tips to, for waiters and hotels, much to the researchers' surprise, all the waiters had to do to, was to start with a positive comment. Good morning, and give a positive weather forecast for the day. And when they did that, their tips went up. So it's amazing to me when I listen to some of these tapes, um, when people will talk about, hey, yeah, traffic is really horrible today, or yeah, that weather is terrible out there. They're saying, don't ever start your calls like that. Don't talk about how bad the traffic is. Don't talk about how bad the weather is. Don't talk about being busy or stress or anything. I always begin with positive comments or a positive anecdote. Great weather, fun weekend, uh, your favorite sports team's winning a game. That kicks the sales call off on the right foot. I can't tell you how often I've heard sales calls start with the guy. And, and it's, I know that you're commiserating with them saying, hey, man, that traffic's bad out there. Oh, that weather's really humid out there. That's really uh, – no. Started out with a positive bang. Why is that? If you start off negative, how easy is it to stay negative? Have you ever been in a room or started a conversation and you're all really happy and then the, the, the first thing out of their mouth is something negative? What does that do to your you emotionally? <laughs> it just it kills you. I mean, it kills the, it brings you down. So don't do that. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. So number one, start all your sales calls with a bang. Number two, don't bad mouth competitors during sales calls. Do we ever, ever, ever with five Q bad mouth our competitors? Never. Now, we let the client discover that for themselves. And one of the things that uh, we'll see here, and again, with somebody who's just starting with the system or has not been paying attention, is at a first meeting, for example, they're, or, uh, they're gathering data from that person. They're gathering data from that person, uh, that prospect. And the prospect will say something like, yeah, well, you know, I'm not, uh, not too pleased with my guy. You know, he's, he never calls us. He's, he's – um, He's the uh, uh, only time uh, we talk to him is when we call him and, you know, and he, he just doesn't seem like he's on the ball and, you know, we're really not very happy with him at all. So what should we do there when they say that?
Well, first of all, what does a classic salesperson do? What does every other advisor out there do when they hear that? What do they start doing? Yeah, they jump on it and they say, whoa, yeah, oh, that, no, that's too bad because, you know, we always kind of know, well, I contact my client on a regular basis. I call them once a month and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm terrific at, at uh, man, that's too bad that he doesn't, he should be doing that. He should be doing that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. What they're doing there is seeking out to see whether you are like every other salesman. I, the, the analogy I gave is like they're fishing. They're going, and then, tick, 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 tick. and then when they throw out this, I don't like my visor, and then you grab on that and start talking about how great you are at that thing and how it's a shame that that other visor is that way. They go, tick, they just hooked you. They said, oh, this guy's just a salesman. Does that make sense? Or, 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 uh, like if they're if you're looking at a variable annuity, and say, uh, a variable annuity, and they'll say, um, you know, I'm not really happy with this investment, and you know, it hasn't performed very well, and I don't know, that just seems like there's some some things going on in there. And then the advisor goes, aha, and they start doing what? A mini 21 point checklist. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of fees in there, and for example, there's a lot, there's there's, there's a mortality expense that's that's really bad, and you know, it's like life insurance. And do you want life insurance? And guys, should you be doing any of that at the first meeting? No. If they say they don't like their advisor for whatever reason, if they say they don't like their uh, investment for whatever reason, what do you say? Oh, wow. Well, that's too bad. Well, I guess that would be something we didn't look at. You know, there's there's good and bad to every investment and or there's good and bad to every advisor. And, you know, that's something uh, that's a, it's a shame that you've experienced that. To, I, you know, and I, I apologize. But uh, uh, in the end, we always find that there's always advantages, always disadvantages. And that's one of the things that we look at. So is that me hammering on either their investment or the guy at that point? What am I saying? Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I feel you. But what? I'm not going to jump on your bandwagon of smashing them. Does that make sense? Don't badmouth your competitors. And a lot of guys that don't understand 5Q will say, well, you, I'm not comfortable attacking my competitors. I'm not comfortable talk, attacking my industry. Our, again, I will repeat this. Do we ever attack the industry? Do we ever attack an advisor? Do we ever say a bad word or syllable about anybody? No, because if you do, they will fight you. The 5Q system is based on motivational interviewing. Well, all you do is ask questions and let the client discover it for themselves. Make sense? Use awesome labels. Use awesome labels. Assign a positive label or trait, like having high intelligence or being a good person, to people generally compels them to live up to that label. That's right out of um, that's right out of how to win Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. Give them uh, a, a a personality or give them a reputation to live up to. How do we use this, guys? See, see how sharp you are today. How do we use this awesome label? Where do we use it? Empower, Tom. You're right. Empower. So that's one of the gots. There's three gots. There's the first one is acknowledge, which is if they say something, say, yeah, absolutely. Or the second one is pair it back. If they say the, the market's going to go up, you say, that's right. The market's going to go up. So they pair it back. But the empower is where you tell them they are above average. So they say the market's going to go up and say, wow, you know, most people at this point still think the market's going to go down. Everybody talk, You're probably the first person I've talked to in, in three weeks that has gotten that answer right. I don't know if this is your, if this is, you know, if you study this, or if you just have awesome insight, or if you have a background in this, but it's amazing that you have said that because everybody else I've talked to has, has been uh, saying the complete opposite. And when you look at the facts, you're right on target. So you're, you moved to the head of the class. So again, I don't know if you're trained in this or you just have insight, but you nailed it. Good job. I mean, virtually nobody else has gotten that right. I'm telling them they're what? Highly what? Intelligent. And when we do empowering, where do we want to do it? You want to do it the first, as early in the meeting as possible to make them feel good about themselves. And if they feel good about themselves, they're going to feel good about you. So if you want to empower them as soon as possible. Give them a, something to live up to as soon as possible in the meeting. The second time you use it is if they make a point for you, a point that you're going to make here in, uh, coming up in the meeting, but they make it before you get there for you, empower them because they, they're doing your job for you. The third is if the meeting goes off the rails for whatever reason, they start getting adversarial, you want to find 
uh, uh, a reason as soon as possible to to pat them on the back and tell them they're above average. So yes, we absolutely leverage this as an extremely powerful tool with 5Q. Set the agenda and stay in control. What's the agenda we set at the, at the beginning of a 21-point checklist? What's the agenda we set at the very, very beginning of the 21-point checklist? There's two things that we set. There's two things that we set. Anybody have clues? Ah, very good, Nick. No decisions today. Today is not about giving you answers because I don't even know what you like and don't like. So what today is about is, is laying out all of the facts. We've really done a good job of, of laying out what you have in great detail. And during this meeting, you're going to tell us what you like and what you don't like. Because I don't know what you like and what you don't like. And I, to be honest with you, I didn't want to do any work <laughs> of designing things for you without knowing what you like and don't like. Because if I spend a lot of time putting together a fantastic plan and you already like what everything is going on, I've wasted my time. So to be honest, I'm not going to waste your time or my time. I'm going to wait to hear what you like and don't like. And at the end of this meeting, you're going to tell me what you, the parts that you like. I'm not going to do anything with that. But if you tell me things you don't like, well, then I'll, I'll put together some other alternatives for that. So that tell, and why do we do that? Why do we let them know that no decisions are going to be made today? I don't have any solutions for you today. There's going to be nothing pitched to you today. Why do I do that? At the very, very beginning. Takes the pressure off. That's right. Takes the pressure off. Brings down their, their um, resistance level. The second thing I'm going to do at the very beginning is say, hey, and, and, and um, looking at everything you've done, you've already done the hard lifting. You've, you've earned great uh, um, income and put away a lot of money for your retirement. You've, you've earned great income for your retirement. You've lowered your debt to virtually nothing in preparation for retirement. So you've done all, if you came to me and those things were still a problem, you hadn't saved any money, you're in debt up to your neck, and you, you have no retirement income coming in, there's nothing I could do. Because that takes years and years and years to do, and you've done it. You've done a fantastic job. So really, anything I would uh, recommend is going to be a very small change because you've already done all the heavy lifting. That's the second agenda. What am I doing there? I'm saying what? Any changes in the future are going to be what? Big or small? And what do people want to do? Small and easy or hard, big and difficult? So do we do this with the 5Q agenda? Absolutely do this. Stand up. Now, we obviously, we don't do this. Um, allows your passion and excitement. This is, if, especially if you're on a telephone call, this is a good thing to do because walking around um, energizes you, but also but at the same time calms you. So you'll be able to burn that. You, you sound more active, more powerful, more uh, in charge when you're walking around, but you're also not um, getting wound up in a, in a more excited way where you're out of breath and, and um, uh, breathing uh, you know, quickly and talking very quickly. So, but we, if you, if you do this during a meeting, how's that going to work? Not well. But if you're making a call you don't want to make, this is a great thing to do to help you do that. Make sense? Use emphasis wisely. Highlighting certain words or phrases in an effective is an effective communication tool that helps you convey your message better. When you listen to me, the last time you watched the 21-point checklist with me doing it with Jeff, how often do I uh, um, emphasize words? And I emphasize words by volume. I emphasize words by slowing down. I emphasize words and phrases by putting big gaps between them, which is what I'm doing what? Right now. Or when we're doing the non-financial, do I want to brag about the fact, well, you know, I, you know very few advisors uh, do the survivor's guide, and very few advisors take a look at the power of attorney and make sure it's working right, and very few, do I do that? No, no, no. I, I apologize, right? I say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Frank. Uh, I, I know this is the, you're probably scratching your head thinking, why is he covering this boring stuff? I want to get to the exciting stuff. I want to get to the investments. And I, I apologize. Can I walk through? I mean, well, first of all, do I get paid for doing that? Am I, am I an attorney? Well, no, you're not. Yeah, so I sometimes scratch my head and wonder why I'm covering this stuff. But can I walk through kind of my thought 
pattern on why I do cover this stuff. Guys, what, what, what do I sound like? What is my voice sounding like? It's a little whiny. Why is it a little whiny? Because I'm what? What am I doing? Bragging or apologizing? When I do that, can they attack me for that? When I talk in that tone of voice, is that somebody you want to attack and get angry at? Or is that somebody you want to come to their, their, uh, come to their aid? Because when you do that, they'll say, no, 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 you're coming. No, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. No worries. No worries. That's what they'll do when I do that. In their head, they might have been thinking, hey, this is boring stuff. Why is it covering it? Let's get to the investments. But by me doing it that way and talking that way, it gets them thinking, well, no, no, don't bang. You know, don't kick yourself for this. This is actually good stuff. You know, I get why you're doing it. So you got it. When it comes to sales, if you're just a robot or you just speak monotone, how successful are you going to be? Because these meetings are an hour long, an hour and a half long. If you talk like a robot, and you have zero inflection, zero pacing, zero changing the tone of your voice, guess how well you're going to do? Not very. Make sense? How can you, what's the best way for you to learn how and where to emphasize and how to, to slow down and do your pacing? Where's the best way to learn that? You could say listen to yourself and, and, and your recordings. Absolutely. But where are you going to learn the skills on how to do that? And where, where in the script do you want to slow down? And where in the script do you want to emphasize? And what kind of tone of voice do you have? Who do you know that does that better than anybody else you know? Who do you know that does, who do you know that, does that better than anybody else you know? Me. So guess what you should be watching? The 21 point checklist training tape. How often should you watch that? If you're really interested in, 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 in guys, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not bragging in that I've been doing this. I mean, I'm the one that created this thing. I've been doing it for 25 years, teaching it for 22 years. Should anybody else be better than me? Should I be the best? If that's the case, how big an idiot or doofus would I be if I invented it and I've been doing it for 25 years and I wasn't the best at it? So I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it's a, it's, it's a fact. So you you watch that training video and watch how I change my pacing. Watch how I change my volume, my inflection, my tone. And those are the kind of things that you want to copy. Make sense? Simplify our options. So. How simple is our sale? Complicated or pretty darn simple? Straightforward and simple, that's right. And our FIA presentation, am I going through and, and giving them three, four, five different options for an FIA or am, am I just saying, hey, here's how this particular investment, here's how the Warren Buffett option works, here's how the market works, and here's how the guaranteed works like CDs and bonds, which one do you want? Do you want the guaranteed? Do you want the market? Or do you want the Warren Buffett option? Is that pretty simple, guys? Yeah, very simple. And then once they want the Warren Buffett, then I'll give them two choices. We have one that works this way, and we have one that works this way. Which one do you want? So keep things simple. I'll tell you what, the worst thing I ever did was getting my CFP. You know why? When I got my CFP, Guess what happened to my plans, my financial plans? Got simple or complicated? Complex. I was making unbelievably beautiful financial plans. <laughs> they could be in the Smithsonian Institute. I was, I was offsetting um, uh, taxes with tax credits. I, was, I mean, I was, they were unbelievably awesome. And what people do with them? Nothing. And then when I went and said, hey, here's what I'd recommend. Here's one thing I'd recommend. Guess what happened? When I, when, instead of doing big, complicated plans, when I just went to, here's what I recommend. There's one thing I recommend, my income exploded. Because people don't, you know, they're thinking, I don't know, that's what, how, think about this guy. Have you ever been uh, making a complicated purchase, whether it's a, um, a car or a TV or whatever, and then they say, well, so do you have any questions? And what do you say? 
No, the reason I came in here was why. So you could tell me what to do. You're the expert. <laughs> I just tell me what to do. That's tell me the best thing, and that's what I want to do. That's why I'm coming to you. So simplify your options. But sometimes, why do why do advisors like to make things complicated? Well, we kind of use that in the 21 point checklist script. Where do we use the fact that investor or uh, uh, um, that that advisors like to make things complicated? Let's give it a little twist here, uh, quiz here. Where do we use that in the 21 point checklist? Where do we leverage that as a Ah, oh, very good. Nick's got it. Anybody else get it? Don't make me sad, guys. Steven's got it. Good job, Steven. Mm, if you don't know the if you don't know the answer to this, guys, how well do you know the twenty one point checklist? And and Jeff, our top ten guys, how many of them are doing twenty one point checklists like clockwork? I'd say all of them. <laughs> Guys, if you want to know what's making people successful, they're doing 21 lights or they're doing 21 point checklists. If you don't know these things, you, that's, if you need to be able to sell tire kickers, you need to be able to sell pet plate lickers, you need to be able to sell people who their son is their advisor, and that's what the 21 point checklists do for you. So diversification, so Nick got it right, Stephen got it right. It's diversification where we say, listen, You've got 15 different, your advisor has you in 15 different investments here, but they're all acting like what? How many investments? When you look at the correlation, they're all acting like the same investment. So why would he want you in 15 different investments when they're all acting like, well, you could have just bought one investment and been just as good, made more, simpler, easier to understand. Why do you do that? Because you want to make things what? Complicated. Why do you want to make things complicated? So you'd need them. See, that we use this. Adopt smart product positioning. The way you frame your product often spells in between a closed deal and a lost opportunity. Guys, do I tell them how great FIAs are? Do we ever tell them how great FIAs are? No. I say, listen, what are the three different methodologies you can use to invest? Well, one is extremely safe, right? What kind of investments are extremely safe? Oh, another one is the market. What kind of investments are market investments? And then there was the Warren Buffett option, which I want to talk about here uh, today. So we're going to talk about three different ways to invest, safe, market, and Warren Buffett option. Now, what are the three things that the market can do? One way is the market can do what? Can go up. What's the second thing the market can do? Can go down. What's the third thing the market can do? Go sideways. So let's take a look at how these three, uh, uh, how these three compare. If the market goes up, do you want to be in a, in a safe investment, a CD, if the market is going up? No. Do you want to be in a market when the market goes up? Yes. Is, is being in the Warren Buffett not quite as good as the market, but is being in the Warren Buffett option okay when the market goes up? Yeah. The market goes down, would you want to be, uh, is being in the safe investment okay? Yes. Is being in the market <laughs> a good place to be or an okay place to be if the market is going down? No. Is being in the Warren Buffett option where you lose no money, when you don't make any money, but you don't lose any money when the market goes uh, down. Is that okay, an okay place to be? How about if the market goes sideways? Is a safe investment the, uh, an okay place to be? Yes. Is the market investment an okay place to be? Because remember, you're paying, we went through, and you, uh, when we went through this in our last meeting, we found out you're paying about 2.5% per year in fees. So that means if the market goes sideways, you're down 2.5%. Is that an okay place to be? Do you want to be in the market losing 2.5%? No. How about the Warren Buffett? Because it, there's no fees when the market goes sideways, so uh, it, your, your, your money just stays where it's Is that an okay place? Yeah, it is. So how often was a safe investment right? Out of three times, three different things can happen. How often was a safe investment right? How often was the market investment right? One time. How often was the Warren Buffett option? Three out of three times. Three out of three times. So why do you think all my clients love the Warren Buffett option? They explain, blah, 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 blah. But let's be honest. I mean, is there a best place to be? If the market goes up, where's the absolute best place to be? Where's the absolute best place to be? The market, yeah, it's the best place. Where's the second best, uh, best place to be? Warren Buffett option. Where's the third best place to be? Safe investments. So if the market goes down, where's the best place to be? safe. Where's the second best place? Because you're making interest. 
Where's the second best place to be? Warren Buffett, because at least you don't lose money. Where's the worst place to be? Well, the market. The market goes sideways. Where's the best place to be? Well, safe investment, right? Because you're making interest. Where's the second best place to be? Warren Buffett, because you don't lose any money. Where's the third place? So here's the thing. I've got a question for you. This is, you were right when you said all of my clients love the Warren Buffett option. The problem with it is what? It's, is it ever the right place to be? Is the Warren Buffett option ever the right place to be? So why? Why would all my clients want to be in the thing that's never the right place to be? Well, if you think about it, yeah, it's never the wrong place. Because if you think about it, can I ever choose to be at the right place at the right time? Can I choose to walk into the convenience store and buy the lottery ticket at the exact right time for it to choose me to win the lottery? Can I do that? No. But can I choose to never be in the wrong place? If my son calls me up and says he's mugged, he's been mugged, I'm like, oh, my God, what happened? I mean, and once I, once I find out he's safe, everything's okay, I'm going to say, well, tell me what happened. He goes, well, last night – I was on the, uh, went out with my guys, and um, uh, they wanted to keep partying, but I wanted to go home. It was 2 in the morning. I decided to go home. I was in the wrong part of town, and uh, my, my, my car was parked 15 blocks away, and I was looking at my phone as I was walking at 2 o'clock in the morning in the wrong side of town, going to my car, and uh, two guys came up and mugged me. What would I say? Did he choose to be in the wrong place at the wrong time at that point? Yes. So you can't choose to be at the right time, but can you avoid being at the wrong place at the wrong time? And what is the Warren Buffett option? Are we, we're never in the right place, but we're also never in the what? Never in the what? Wrong place. So it's mistake what? Proof. Mistake proof. So guys, is that an example that I just walked through a perfect example of uh, positioning the the FIA. Do you see why that graph works so well? Those of you that have done this graph, how many people say, yeah, but in the end, I think I'd rather do a market, or in the end, I'd rather do a CD. How many people you've done this with say, give me the Warren Buffett option? What percentage of people? And if, you, if it's not 100%, you need to send Jeff or myself the tape. <laughs> Make sense? Get emotional. The key finding behavior economics is that people rarely hinge their purchase decisions solely on rational grounds. Do we use this with 5Q? Yes. Why, how do we get people emotional? Or what do we get people emotional about? Why do we get 100% of people that we want to move their money, even if their son is their advisor, even if their best friend is their advisor of 15 years? What gets them to move? Yes, their advisor. Because I love it. Why do I love... It, when they tell me that they love their advisor. Why do I love it? I'm like, oh, good. Uh, this person is 100% guaranteed to move their money to you. Most advisors out there, when they hear that are not 5Q trained, when they hear, well, oh, I love my advisor. He's been with me for 15 years. He's my next door neighbor. They think, oh, my God, this, this is not going anywhere. I think uh, as soon as they leave the office, I run around doing, doing my little dancing jig saying, I'm going to get that client. Why? Why do I know? Do you expect strangers to screw you? Or, and you don't expect them to screw you. Are you overly surprised if a stranger screws you, though? You're disappointed, but are you surprised? But if your best friend, who's your next-door neighbor, for 15 years screws you, that's what? Emotional or not emotional? Why, why, do, why do divorces 90% of the time get just nasty? Because this is a person you what? Trusted, invested years with, uh, had children with, and when they screw you, you're what? Rational or piss off? And that's what happens. And do we use that with 5Q? Yes, the whole point of the 20 point checklist is not about paying too much in fees, not about paying too much in taxes, not about taking too much risk, not about not being diversified. Those are all excuses to talk about what? If we talk about those things. But is it those things that we're, we're talking about, or what are we actually talking about with each one of those things? Fees, taxes, diversification, risk. What are we actually talking about? Yes, their advisor, Dale, exactly right. The fact that their advisor did not share those things with them, and they get what? Torqued. Clarify the product's value. Did I do that with that, that table that I just went through? Do I clarify the product's value with that table I just went through? 
Yes. Guys, if you haven't looked at the fixed index annuity sell, uh, uh, presentation in a while, go back and look at it. It has, it has, in fact, the only problem, the only objection we ever get with our FI presentation is what? Yeah, they want to make put all of their money into it, and we can't, so we have to overcome that and have them tell them they can't put all their money into it. Number 11, empower their customers. We just talked about this earlier. That give them a reputation to uh, um, live up to, that's what we do when we empower. So we actually do, and they use the exact word we use, empower clients. There's a time for everything. In life, as in sales, timing matters. Depending on your industry, specific prospect, you're engaging the proper timing for making calls, doing presentations, sending emails, scheduling meetings, et cetera. I will tell you one thing about timing, and that is this. Nobody ever leaves my office without what? I don't care if it's a first meeting, second meeting, or third meeting. Nobody ever needs my office without the next appointment. And when do I book the next appointment? Missy, when do I book every single – the years I'm making a, a, a million. And, again, guys, think about this. At this point, and I, I've talked, I haven't talked about this for a long time. I made a million back in 2000, 1999 and 2000. What would that be worth today? If I made a million in 2000. 1999, 2000, it's 2022 today. What would that be worth today? Yeah, a lot closer to two. Now, I was also only working with nurses. 90% of my clients are nurses, teachers, or IBM engineers. And all of those had pensions. So how much money did they have in 401ks and 503Bs? A lot or a little compared to today? So you, you add that, the fact that just the time value of money and the fact that people have a hell of a lot more money to move today because they don't, can't rely on pensions, guess how much money I would make in today's world? Not one million, be a hell of a lot more, be two, two and a half million, just doing the same things that I was doing back then. So guys, you can, what you can make in this industry is unlimited. But one of the things that I did to, to, to be that efficient when I didn't have all that much money to work with, Missy and I were laughing. My average client size was 225, 225,000. That was my average client size, guys. Is that a big case or a small case? Is that, how would you, that's peanuts in today's world. But the reason I was made so much is, is because I was the McDonald's of the advisory industry. I was running 30 appointments a week. I was busy, 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 busy. And the way I was able to do that is, Missy, how, when did I set my, uh, how far in the future did I set my appoint next appointment? No one ever left our office until we had another appointment. Um, but and was it scheduled that. for next month or next week? Nope, next week. Everything was scheduled within a week. So, guys, I was closing deals in, in two weeks. Meeting one, week later, meeting two, week later, meeting three. How many weeks is that? Three weeks or two weeks? I meet somebody. On a Monday, schedule it for next Monday, and schedule it for the next Monday. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. And Jeff, when you talk to advisors, what are far? What is the closing cycle for most advisors? Two weeks? No, it's closer to eight to twelve. Guys, what's going on? If if you're not closing people in two weeks, you should what? And here's what I would just say, guys. If the system is not working. The way we advertise it, we've got 60,000 recorded tapes of it working exactly as it's advertised. If it's not working that way for you, what do you need to do immediately? If it's not working the way we advertise it for you, if you're, if you're getting objections at the FIA presentation, if you're getting um, people being uh, obstinate at a 21-point checklist, if it's taking you two months to close a case, what do you need to do? Yes. Get on Jeff's or my calendar so we can help you fix it, okay? Uh, Ben's asking, after the last appointment uh, and you make the delivery, do you make the review appointment for a, a year later? No. That's, no. Once I get the case, Ben, then they go into my CRM, and we do um, – we would have every six months we would meet for folks. So, but we don't make that in advance. We would just call them at that, that point. So that's a good question, Ben. But during the selling process, guess what? Every day of delay in that selling process makes your chances of selling them go up or go down. Their chance of getting cold feet go up or go down. 
So that's why it was it was a meeting, week later meeting, week later meeting. Now that's what I was shooting for. That didn't happen all the time, but it happened 80% of the time, guys. And would you say 80% of your <laughs> meetings are in a two-week process with a client? If it's not, and here's what I found. Do you think every single client was okay with that thing? Hey, no, no, that sounds good. Let's meet next week. No. It, you get, but you have to let them know why it's important to meet quickly. And if you're, if you're having problems with that, get a hold of us. Make sense? Serve hot, not cold. Particularly, uh, practically speaking, cold calling is becoming a relic of the past. Guys, what should you be doing right now? What, what is the best thing? If you're not marketing, what is the absolute top of the, top of the ladder thing you should be doing right now? If you're not marketing, what should you be doing right now? Well, learning the script, I don't agree with that, but even more important than that, or what's the best way to learn the script? How about that? What's the best way to learn the script? Yes, doing client reviews, Kevin, very good. And those client reviews should be just reviews or they should be 21 lights? You should be doing the 21 lights. And number 14, observe, record, and predict. We talked about this earlier, the, what does Tom Brady do? He's not, he's not all that athletic. He's not that strong. What he does is he's, he watches tapes over and over and over and over. How many of you guys have, uh, have watched your, or listened to yourself in the last week? Listen to you with a client in the last week on a tape. Because really, guys, remember, the year I made a million dollars, what was I doing? I, I listened to a tape, a full hour tape. Every single day. Every single day. Why? Why? Because I wanted to close everybody. And I was still developing. I was, I was finally putting the, the last. I take that back. The year I made a million, I wasn't listening to a full tape every day. I was doing a 15-minute drill every day. Just a little snippet, snippet, snippet. But the year I went from 50000 to 350000 in income, I was listening to a full one-hour tape per day, even if it was the same tape I wish to listen to yesterday because I didn't have enough tapes. Because what I was doing is figuring out what worked and what didn't work. What was I doing right? What was I doing wrong? And when you do that thing wrong, what's the, and you hear yourself do that thing wrong five times, what are you likely not to do in the next meeting? That thing. So if you're not watching your listening to your tapes daily during the 15-minute drill, if you haven't listened to yourself in the last month, what does that tell you about your desire to be a better financial advisor, your desire to make more money? What does it tell you about your desire? Yeah, it's low. Make it about you too. Selling is a two-way street. Even if you take care of customers but neglect honing your skills and attitude as a sales practitioner, you won't go as high as you could. Customers warm up to and trust business contacts who masters of their craft. Masters of the craft. What are some of the ways that you can master your craft? Show that you're a master of your craft. What are some of the ways that people can know immediately that you are very good, Nick? A right upside down is one of them. Be able to write upside down. What's another way you could do it? Know your scripts backwards and forwards and do them with what? Tone, feeling, pacing, different uh, uh, um, emphasis. Writing upside down, using props. How many of you are using the $3,000 in cash prop to get people to, uh, during a 21 point checklist to understand that that money that they're losing is real money, not fake, not just some, some number on paper. There's a hell of a big difference to people when it's $3,000 cash in front of them and $3,000 on paper. If I've got $3 million, how much does $3,000 sound like? Oh, you know, you're paying $3,000 too much in the fees. Oh, no, I guess, yeah, I guess I am. But I, I guess it's not really hurting my lifestyle at all. But what happens when you start counting out $100 bills? Here's how much. Can I show you what $3,000 means? Well, I, yeah. So I go to my little cigar box that I have in my desk, pull it out, and I put, open it up, and there's a wad of cash here. This is what it means. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 1,000. 
And I push it towards her and say, that's what it is. It's like somebody coming up to your door, knocks on your door every six months because you're, you're spending $6,000 in unneeded fees. That's like somebody every six months knocking on your door and handing you this cash. Would, would that make you happy or not happy if somebody did that every six months? Oh, and by the way, you pay no taxes on that either. No fees on that. It's $3,000 right in your pocket. Good thing or bad thing? Well, that's a big good thing. Well, that's what, that's being paid out right now every six months. But they're not going up to your door and giving them the 3000 Guess who they're giving the $3,000 to? Well, my advisor. Yeah. So if you're okay with that, that's cool. Does that make you happy or not happy? Do you want that money going to you or to him? And remember, guys, this is at the very end of the meeting. They already hate their guy. So how many of them say they want that 3000 to go to their guy? Zero. How many of you use big calculators and let the clients do the calculating for you? So using props shows that you're master of your craft. Doing the tax calculations in just two minutes in front of them. I, in the first meeting with people, I would say, would you like to know about how much you could save in taxes if you so chose? Yeah, I'd pull out my 1040 and I would be able to, and my worksheet on Social Security, and I'd be able to calculate within two minutes, within two minutes, how much tax they could save if they wanted to make changes. How many of you can do that, guys? Do a, a mock tax return in two minutes right in front of them. Does that show them that I'm a master of my craft or not, if I'm able to do that? What did they think about me at that first meeting, without me bragging at all? Had their, had their accountant done that? Had their advisor done that? And here's this strange guy, first time they met him, and he's doing this calculation right in front of them. Don't know how to do that? Well, we have a coaching call right on that. 126, 2015, mock tax return, a powerful tool, how you do it. And a lot of guys say, well, I'm not really comfortable with that. I don't really know. Guys, uh, neither am I. <laughs> I have an accountant. I had an accountant back then, too. Why did I do that? Because you don't have to be an accountant to show how much money they could. All you're basically doing is saying, listen, if you didn't have any interest, any capital gains, and you got rid of that stuff, and then you um, uh, that would lower the amount of tax pay on Social Security, here's how much you'd save in tax. It's not that difficult. And it makes you look like a master of your craft. I was a master at all of these things. But I tell you what, if you're a master at just one or two of these things, what's going to happen to their view of you? But you can imagine if you're a master at all of these things, what do they think about you? Are they half in the bag at that point? So does that make sense? Guys, if you're going to, if you want to, not if, you, if you're uh, at the end of your career and you're like, dude, I don't need to make a million dollars. I don't need to make $2 million. All I want to do is uh, use one or two of your things. That's cool. But if you're serious about becoming the best advisor to your client and making the most amount of money, because here's the thing, guys. There are lots of guys that work 40 hours a week that don't make a million. But I worked 40 hours a week and made $2 million. Why? Because I was smarter? No, because I worked where? On the front end or weekly? Because once I knew how to do this stuff, how much work did it take to do this stuff? took me probably about six months to get to the point where I could do this in two minutes. Six months. Writing upside down? Yeah, probably a bit, uh, two or three months. It took a lot of work to be able to do this, but once I knew it, how much work did it take? See, selling is either the highest paying, easiest job in the world or the lowest paying, hardest job in the world. But if it's the highest paying, easiest job in the world, was it easy to begin with or did it, you have to work to get to that point. I mean, if you look at a professional baseball player, is really is that is playing baseball all that difficult for a professional baseball player? Or a professional golfer, is is shooting around a golf really that difficult for a professional golfer? Is it playing a baseball game really that difficult for a baseball player? No, it isn't. But was it difficult? Did they have to work like a banshee to get the skills to get to that point? Yes. So all the work is done up front. Once you know it, guess what? Then it's just a little bit of fine tuning to keep it that way. Make sense? So again, if you're at the end of your career and you're like, dude, I don't need to make that kind of money. I just want to have a good life, use a few of these skills, close a few extra cases, super. Choose one or two of these things to work on. But if you want to make, uh, you know, if, if you're working a regular work week and you're not making a million dollars a year, are you making mistakes? Yes. 
if you're working a regular work week and not making a million dollars a year, because you have a system in front of you that if you want to learn the skills, you could make two million or more per year. I didn't do those, and, and Jeff and Missy, did we, have we had advisors in the last 20 years that make far more than I made? Yep, we've had that. Absolutely. So it's not me and my skills, guys. It's the system. Because <laughs> when we had guys that, that make more than us, uh, some of the other guys say, hey, can we talk to him? Can we talk to him? Can we talk to him? And it's like, uh, yeah, sure, talk to him. And guess what the, the, the other advisor would say? Hey, what are you doing? I mean, what's doing? What's working? And guess what the advisor that was doing better than me said? That, was he doing anything different than what I taught him? Or was he doing exactly what I laid out for him? They, was, they would just say, I'm following Mike's guidance. I'm using the 21-point checklist. I'm, I'm doing my 15-minute drill. I'm using the FIA presentation. That's how they make that kind of money. It's not me. It's the system. Anybody that uses the system and uses Jeff and myself as coaches can make as much money as they want, and you don't have to work longer hours to do it. You have to work smarter hours to do it. Make sense? And if you don't want to do that, at least make sure you're going back to your clients and doing 21 lights. So that gives you something that we're coming into the fall season. Think about what you're going to do at the last big chunk of September, October, and part of November. That's you got to make all the money you're going to make for the rest of the year is coming in the next two and a half months. What are you going to do to make sure that happens? Make sense? Super. You guys have a wonderful uh, holiday weekend. But use at least part of that week to think about what am I going to do in the next two and a half months to have a great finish to 2022. Make sense? Thanks, everybody. Have a great uh, holiday weekend and a great rest of the week. Thanks.